This is a question I get asked all the time. I get a couple of emails a week. Really? Yeah, just like I get I get some fantastic emails from people all over the world for, for, due to the spread of these of these videos on YouTube. And a big one is people asking me about shorter cranks. Like, how do I know when I need shorter cranks? Now, I've put together a list of five major kind of categories for, for people. You know, how would you if you conform to one of these categories? If you identify like this, you might want to consider trying typically some 165s. But if you're a really 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 short person potentially even below that, right? So if you're extremely proportioned, your seat height's down below like 650 millimeters, for example, you could even consider going shorter than, than 165s. But most of what the analogies I'll use here, most of the ex examples I'll use are people going down to 165, which tends to be short enough for most people under most circumstances to achieve what we want to achieve. So. What are the five big ones? Now, the, the big one that, that's the easiest, or probably this, definitely the easiest, I think, to, to kind of uh, test on yourself, if you've got major hip flexion limitations. So hip flexion limitations means, basically, if you're lying on your back and you can't pull your knee up and get your, get your, your thigh almost flat on your chest, I would say that you've got some low level of limitation of hip flexion, right? If you're a little bit off your chest, you know, 20 degrees off your chest, you're borderline. And if you're down here at like a 45 degree angle, you've got what I would call a major flexion limitation in your hip, right? Or a big gut. Or a big gut. Yeah, that, <laughs> that could, could be, be the issue. limiting factor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we cool. call that, you know, the, the delicate term for that is soft tissue opposition. Okay. <laughs> right. So look, if, okay. you, if you're a big guy or a big yeah. lady and, and you're just mechanically limited there, yeah. you need to get rid of the spare tire around the middle. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have a limitation here, yeah. right? But nonetheless, it is a limitation. So if you're really overweight and you're, you're using cycling to lose a lot of weight and you can't get your hip up here because of this, yeah. Consider some shorter cranks because you'll have a consequence from that. And the consequence will be that as your hip rises, you'll either bounce left and right on the saddle as the hip strikes the front of the socket or strikes your stomach. Mm. It will rock you and you'll bounce and you'll get saddle discomfort and all sorts of things. Or you'll just rotate your pelvis back and you have to sit really upright. You'll try and compensate around it. And bike fitting in my profession is all about, an, it's an exercise in decompensation, as my old mate Steve Hogg used to say. We are trying to remove compensation strategies. So if, if you've got a hip flexion limitation, whether it's due to mechanical issues in your hip like yours, which is a mechanical hip impingement problem, or just extra weight around the middle, Shorter cranks, have a, you know, consider them. 165 is usually short enough for a, a normal sized person between sort of five foot eight and, and six foot two. Um, but if you're, if you're really short, if you're down below, you know, your seat height is down below about 650 millimeters or 670 millimeters, you might even want to consider going shorter than that again because the length of the leg as a lever does play into this a little bit. The taller you are, the, the less short you need to go generally to achieve these goals. Number two, if you've got really poor hip internal rotation, and this is a bit of you, this is mainly yours here. So if your hip, when it's up at 90 degrees, if you've got less than about 10 or 15 degrees of what we call internal rotation available in your hip, you, you will see a lot of the time that that rider's knees will splay laterally on the bike, right? And there's two methods of dealing with that. One of them is to move your feet further apart, but the other one is to use shorter cranks, right? So the knee doesn't have to rise as high. They get less mechanical impingement at the front of the acetabulum where the neck of the femur is striking the top of the, the socket of the hip and their knees won't splay out as much because the knee doesn't have to rise as high because the crank arm is shorter. So if you've got really bad hip internal rotation, your knees are splaying when you video yourself on the bike, you might want to consider some shorter cranks as well. That's a pretty a good reason. So number three, if you've got really short legs and your seat height is down below six, 650, definitely, definitely. But if it's below sort of 675, 680, or even 700 mil, you might want to consider it. That's what I would call sort of below the median in terms of, of seat heights. With an average seat height, if we had a bell curve of all the seat heights that I've set up over the last 13 years or whatever it's been, the median there would be somewhere around that 725 to 750 range. It's kind of a normalish sort of seat height. If you're way down below that, means you've got short legs or you're a big heel dropper or whatever, but if your seat height's really low, it means you've probably got very short levers, which means you may do better with shorter cranks. And that's one of the reasons why we see smaller bikes coming out with shorter cranks on them. You don't often get a triple extra small Canyon come out with 175 mil cranks because those small legs of that rider are gonna have difficulty controlling that big movement of the foot through, through space with the longer crank. So shorter legs often means that you're better off going down to 165. 
Number four, if you are a triathlete or an ultra distance rider or a specialized long distance time trialer. Now, short cranks in my experience, if the effort is steady, if the, the effort that you're trying to compete in, if you're riding in a, a long distance time trial, which basically a triathlon is the most common scenario where we'd see that, and the, the course is fairly flat, and you need to be able to do two things. You need to be able to be in an aerodynamic position, and you also need the effort to be long, steady state cardiovascular effort. So not a lot of wattage spikes. It's not like a criterium race where the wattage is spiking up and down all the time. If it's a long, steady state effort at a steady wattage and aerodynamics is part of the deal here, particularly with time trialing and ultra distance riding, the short cranks will almost always allow a person to operate with a lower front end. And that can mean a 10 watt saving at, at your 38 kilometers an hour or whatever that you're doing in your triathlon if you're doing a 70.3 and you're kind of, you know, operating at speeds above 35 kilometers an hour, the shorter cranks can actually be quite helpful just by being able to drop the front of the time trial bike by 10 or 15 millimeters because of the better hip clearance that they create. So you can get some free speed, some free aerodynamic speed out of the shorter cranks. And that's why you see a lot of time trial people in the last five to 10 years moving to shorter cranks. And I'm sure it's partly to do with a lot of these videos where we talk about short cranks being beneficial. Um, so probably you, know, you and I have had some influence on that as well, but a lot of other people talking about this and it is often more worth it than not. Yes. The counter, the counter argument to that is if you've got amazing hip mobility, you're very tall, you can operate with an incredibly low position on a time trial bike, it may not be an issue for yes. you. You may prefer the longer cranks, right? But you know, the more of these categories that you meet, the more likely it is that you'll do better with shorter cranks. Number four, and this one is this one is actually me. You know, so we've spoken about your issue with your hip impingement. This this is a good example of me. So the, the main reason that I use 165s, I have a regular kind of seat height of like 750, 760, depending upon the saddle that I'm using. I don't have hip impingement issues. I'm relatively mobile. The reason I prefer small, shorter cranks, I, I use 165s as you do. The reason I do it is because of my physiology. I am by nature a cardiovascular rider, right? So I, I operate really well at high cadences using low force. So wattage is a combination of cadence and force. So you can produce 300 watts at a low cadence with a lot of pedal effort, or you can do it at a high cadence with a lower pedal effort, right? And you're still producing 300 watts. Now, the way that I'm built, which is tall, you know, lean and skinny and not a lot of muscle mass, I produce my high wattages at high cadences with low force. That's just the way my body operates. If you're a person who grinds the gear out at 65 RPM when you're going full gas, this is not gonna be as helpful for you. But if you are like me, if you're a lightly built guy with or, or girl with really good leg speed, you can operate at 120 RPM without too many problems on the bike, really high cadences, and you're not particularly you know, steered towards really strong, low cadence efforts on the bike, you might wanna consider shorter cranks for the performance advantage. Essentially, your, your, your cadence tends to naturally go up anyway, and if you're not really good at producing low cadence, high force efforts, you might as well steer the crank length towards your own physiology so that your foot is prescribing smaller arcs in the air, you're operating at higher cadences in more of a cardiovascular sense. And, and so that's, that's how I operate best. And that's one of those things that you will, you have to look at yourself and go, okay, well, I, I don't tick any of those other boxes, but I am lean and I'm not very strong and I don't have a good squat or deadlift. I don't have a good sprint, but I'm really good cardiovascularly. In that situation, you may also prefer shorter cranks. And you'll notice that, that your short efforts are done, at, your short hard efforts are done at a much higher cadence, mm -hmm. but with the same sort of wattage. Yeah, so that for me has been worth it. Yeah. yeah, in my in my case, it will also operate me. It will also allow me to operate in lower torso positions on the bike, which you know it's very hard to measure that aerodynamic advantage from the shorter cranks. But for me, it's definitely been worth it. So unlike you, I don't get sort of pain if I operate with longer cranks. But the performance advantage from being a leanly built, high cadence, low force rider <coughs> is well worth it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the disadvantage then of going to 165s? Is there any disadvantage? Because you've talked about a lot of advantages. 
advantages. A lot of advantages, yeah. yeah. I'm sold. Yeah, so really, really the disadvantage is your ability to produce neuromuscular efforts at very short notice, I right. find, right? So let's say you're in a crit race and someone jumps, someone attacks. Uh, I find that with the shorter cranks, you have to wind them up a little bit. Mm. So if you're trying to do like a, a 600 or 800 watt short sort of sprint effort to get back up on someone's wheel, the graph of how you produce that force might sort of go like this with the shorter cranks, whereas with longer cranks, it's more instantaneous, mm. right? So you can get to that peak power a little bit quicker with mm. longer cranks. And in a crit race, if you're getting dropped out of the wheel, out of the draft by three meters, that can mean all the difference between hanging onto that wheel and not hanging onto that wheel. So there is a bit of a detriment, I think, to really short cranks in specific road racing situations like that. And also if your physiology is is built that way or versus the other way. So a great example is like me versus Craig Wiggins, who we've had on the channel before, who's really powerful neuromuscularly, amazing sprint efforts, that sort of stuff. And he, you know, we've spoken about this when we were down in Adelaide at the TDU. When the bunch surges, I get tailed off a bit and then I wind up the cranks and get back in the wheel. Craig just does three super hard pedal strokes and stays yeah. in the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have the neuromuscular strength to do that. That's not the way I'm built, but he stays in the draft better. Now yeah. you could debate endlessly about who's conserving more energy in those two situations because his wattage spike is much higher and more vicious than mine. Yeah. But his physiology is better at dealing with it because yeah. he's that kind of rider, you know? And mine doesn't deal with it well. So over the years, I've just noticed going from 172s to 165s, for me, overall, it has been worth it. Purely, not for those biomechanical reasons, but purely from an efficiency standpoint, uh, it, it's been worth it for me, yeah. Cool. So those are the five major reasons why you might want to consider shorter cranks. Yeah, so hopefully that'll help some people out there to diagnose. It's a bit complicated, that stuff. Um, but well, I think you were pretty clear. Cool. Good. I yeah. hope I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the annoying thing about it is that it's one of those things that you will never know if it's going to work until you try it. Yeah. Mm. Don't uh, knock it till you try it. <laughs> don't knock it till you try it, as you <laughs> found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you were on 172s forever. Yeah. And when we eventually got you on the 165s, you're like, oh, I should have done this a while ago. Yeah, and now I'm on an Eagle Beak saddle as well. Eagle don't knock Beak it till saddle, you try it. Short cranks, <laughs> mate. It's all happening for you. <laughs> We're going to have you back right. on speed, speed play soon, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. No worries.